Photographers, have you ever wanted to try your hand at shooting film, but whether due to fear or overwhelm or just lack of equipment, never got a crack at it? Fear not. Today, we're going over the exact tools that you need to try your hand at analog photography. This is Bite Size Business, where we're helping entrepreneurs become the hero of their own creative small business. I'm your host, Abby Grace. I'm an international photographer who also loves educating for creative entrepreneurs. Here on Bite Size Business, we share both practical strategy for creative entrepreneurs, as well as hands-on tips and tricks for budding photographers. So if that sounds like your brand of strawberry jam, definitely consider subscribing. It's kind of a funny conundrum if you think about it, right? Digital photographers being somewhat afraid to learn how to shoot film, considering the fact that film is where photography began, but it's actually pretty understandable. If you look at the market by around 2005 or 2006, digital cameras had almost completely replaced film equipment, both for consumers and for professionals. And so for photographers who are looking to get into the craft now, who've maybe only been shooting for a couple of years or been in business for a few months, film was never anything they had to learn to shoot in the first place. They never had to transition from film to digital. Film was what came in the disposable camera at CVS that then you dropped back off at CVS or Walgreens. Film is maybe what your parents shot when you were on vacation as a very small child or what your grandparents shot, but it's never something that a lot of photographers these days ever had to use for their profession or as an art form. My story began a little differently considering the fact that my love affair with photography actually began in the darkroom. I took a black and white film class when I was in college where we learned both how to shoot black and white film and then also develop that in the darkroom. When I decided to start shooting weddings and portraits, however, I definitely made the decision to do that on digital because to me, that felt like the safest way to preserve my clients' memories while I was also still trying to learn just how to be a photographer and how to interact with clients and how exposure and aperture and ISO all interact with one another. In 2012, after a couple of years of shooting weddings with a digital camera, I decided that I wanted to learn how to shoot with color film. I knew how to shoot black and white film. I knew the basic rules of everything that went into shooting black and white, but with color film, it just felt like a different beast and I was really overwhelmed. I didn't know where to start. What, you know, what film stock should I use? What camera should I use? Should I use 35 millimeter or medium format? There were so many questions. And so if that's where you are today, stay with me because we're going over five steps that you need to just get started and shoot your first roll of analog film. Step one is going to be to choose a format and a camera. Before you can start shooting film, you need to understand the difference between 35 millimeter and medium format. There's also large format film photography, but that's generally not something you're gonna play with and you're just starting to get into it. So the two main choices are gonna be 35 millimeter and medium format. So what's the main difference? Well, the simplest answer is going to be size. This is 35 millimeter film. You've probably seen this before in CVS cameras or what your parents used to shoot when you were a kid. And this is medium format, otherwise known as 120 film. Because the negatives from 120 film are larger, it means that your negatives are gonna have a higher resolution. I like to liken it to shooting on like smaller medium JPEG versus large JPEG. Larger film scans are gonna mean higher resolution, which means you can make bigger enlargements of your film. So just to show you guys the difference in size between 35 millimeter and 120, this is a sheet of 35 millimeter film negatives, and this is a sheet of 120 negatives. We'll turn it on its side so you can see how much bigger 120 is than 35 millimeter. Definitely makes a difference in the resolution and allows for much bigger enlargements with your prints. In general, 35 millimeter is going to be the easiest transition for digital photographers because it's the same dimensions that you're currently shooting with your digital camera. When it comes to choosing your camera, you can start off with something super simple like your mom's old Canon AE-1. This is a great little camera. I absolutely love it. This is what I fell in love with when I first started shooting black and white film, and I still use it to this day with color. It can shoot both, um, but I still use it to this day when we go on vacation and I want to have something small and non-obtrusive. If you are looking for something a little bit more high tech, you could try a more updated version of a 35 millimeter film camera. This is the Canon EOS 3. This works with all of my current Canon lenses. If you're a Nikon shooter, you could try something like the Nikon F6 or the Nikon FE2, which should work with your current range of Nikon lenses. If you're looking to try medium format film, then I would suggest starting with a 645 camera. That means a camera that shoots with negatives that result in a six by 4.5 centimeter negative. So this is the Pentax 645. I really like it. This is my backup camera for weddings and I've had to use it on occasion and I really enjoy the way that it shoots. It's not intimidating. It's not overly complicated. It's great for someone who's looking to start. And then we also have an option like the Yashica 124. This is what's called a twin lens reflex camera where you look down through here to take your picture. It takes square photographs, or as Matt likes to call it, Instagram before Instagram existed. Um, it shoots six by six, so six centimeters by six centimeters, and it's got two lenses right here, hence the name Twin Lens Reflex. Step two, purchase some film. 
This is where you guys are going to want to decide, do you want to start with black and white or do you want to start with color? There is absolutely no right answer, but I do recommend choosing one to start with, mastering that, and then moving on to the other one. Black and white film tends to behave a little bit differently than color film, and trying to learn both at the same time might mean you end up pretty confused and messing up some of your exposures on each one. So I would choose either start with black and white or start with color, but I wouldn't do both at the same time. When it comes to color film, there are two main stocks that I recommend people start with. Portrait 400 is hands down my favorite film stock to recommend to new photographers. It's flexible, it's got a little bit more latitude than most color films do, especially when it comes to underexposure. And so if you do find that you're struggling a little bit with your exposures, Portrait 400 is gonna be much more forgiving than a lot of other color films on the market. Then there's also Fuji 400H. This is my personal favorite. This is what I use with weddings, anniversaries, engagement sessions, travel, ballerinas, all of it. Um, but it is a little bit more of a finicky film than Portra 400. And so I recommend trying both. You might decide that you are absolutely obsessed with Portra. Portra is a Kodak film, by the way. Um, or you might completely fall in love with Fuji, but I recommend trying both because you never know what you like until you give them both a chance. Also, Portra 400 and Fuji 400H both come in 120 and 35 millimeter formats in case you're wondering. When it comes to black and white film, there are two main stocks that I recommend trying. The first is Kodak 400 Tri-X, and the next is Ilford HP5 Plus. Both of these are 400 speed films, and they both come in 35 millimeter and 120. The great thing about these black and white films is that they've got a little bit of latitude, much like Portra 400, in that if you under or overexpose them a little bit, you're not gonna completely blow your frames. Step number three, obtain a light meter. The purpose of a light meter is to measure light. See, when I was first starting out with color film, I made the mistake of taking my digital camera, taking a few photos until I got my exposure right, and then plugging whatever my shutter speed and aperture were into my film camera. Well, the problem is it doesn't work that way. See, as digital photographers, we're taught to err on the side of underexposure, but film is the exact opposite. So you can't take a digital camera's readings and try to plug that into a film camera because it'll completely underexpose your images. This is why you need an external light meter, because what an external light meter is gonna do is allow you to get up nice and close and measure the light that's actually falling on your subjects. Personally, I use the Siconic L858. Um, before this one, I had the Siconic L358, and I'll link to all of these in the show notes below. You don't have to use something big and bulky like this because truthfully, these are a bit expensive. You could use something a little bit more low key like the Lumu, which is a light meter that was specifically made for the iPhone. My friend Catherine uses one and really likes it. It's super portable and not quite as intimidating as something big and bulky like this. But the moral of the story is that you have to get an external light meter because using a digital camera or using the in-camera meter in whatever film camera you might have is just not gonna cut it. Step number four, shoot your heart out. I mean, I, I feel like that one's pretty self-explanatory. No, but seriously, go out and shoot. You're not gonna know what works until you get out there, shoot, and get your scans back from your lab. I usually suggest starting with anywhere from two to four rolls that you send off in your first order. What that'll do is one, help you make sure that your camera's actually working, and two, give you feedback in the form of scans from your lab to let you know if the way that you're exposing is working. It would be a real shame for you to go and shoot like 15 rolls of film only to learn after you've spent all that money on both the film and the processing that what you were doing wasn't working. Step number five, send your film to a good lab. I spent my first couple of months experimenting with color film, having all of my film developed by a local one hour photo lab. I also spent my first couple of months experimenting with color film, being super frustrated by everything I got back from the lab. Coincidence? I think not. See, the lab that I was entrusting my photos with, which were all personal work, none of it was client work, so there was no real loss there, but all of those photos that they were developing, they were using the same equipment that one would use for developing a disposable camera. It wasn't top of the line professional equipment that was helping my film look the very best that it could. Granted, they didn't have much to work with because I had no idea what the heck I was doing, but I have a feeling if I'd been working with a lab who was committed to helping photographers improve their film skills, instead of just churning out rolls of film within one hour, that I probably would have grown a lot faster in those first couple of months. I've sent my work to numerous labs over the years. Indie Photo Lab, Richard Photo Lab, The Find Lab, Fast Photo and Digital. And the thing is, you have to find the lab that works for you. There's no one right answer. I do always recommend sending your first few orders to the same lab just so you can get some consistency and start to understand the behaviors of film and, and how that changes based on how you're changing your exposure. At the end of the day, the best way to learn how to shoot film is to get out there and shoot some film. Put some rolls through your camera, make mistakes, send them off to the lab, fall in love with the result, maybe not, try harder the next time. Just get out there and do it because the thing is, the longer you spend sitting and wishing, the longer it's gonna be before you actually fall in love with analog photography. That's all I've got for you guys today, so make sure, as always, that you hit like and then subscribe so you can stay up to date with all things Bite Size Business. We'll see you guys next Friday.